Hi, I'm Neil, and you're listening to The Whaler Podcast, a series where we sit down for a fireside chat with luminaries from the creative industry to learn how they got to where they are, how they feel about the current advertising landscape, and what keeps them up at night. In this episode, I'm joined by Scylla Snowball, the group chairman and group CEO of AMV BBDO. Scylla has worked in the advertising industry for more than 30 years and has spent the last 24 at AMV. Scylla, thank you very much for joining me today. Pleasure. I hope this is true. I read somewhere that um, you actually applied to AMV on the graduate training scheme 11 years before getting your first job I here. did, and I was rejected, which <laughs> I haven't let Peter Mead forget um, for the rest of his life. That is an amazing uh, little No, story. I applied as a graduate, uh, an undergraduate. Well, I just graduated. And so what applied. were you, I guess, two questions. What were you studying, and had advertising always been something that you'd wanted to get into? Uh, not always, no. I did a French degree and came to the end of my degree, I think, like most people, and started thinking about work. And I wasn't sure whether I should go into marketing or advertising and in the end decided on advertising because I thought there'd be more variety uh, of roles. Uh, And so set about applying to ad agencies and AMV hadn't been going long by that stage, um, but they still rejected me (laughs) without interview. Without an interview? Yeah, without an interview. (laughs) Yeah. You got a rejection email. Or I wish I'd kept should... it. I wish I'd kept it. That would have been um, a great momentum. Yeah, there are, there are a few of us that work for AMV and BBDO now that have kept their rejection letters. But it just goes to show, you know, in, in the end, it all works out. Never give up. Quite, quite. Actually, and if I can just pick up on one point, you made an interesting distinction there between advertising and marketing. How do you draw the distinction between the two? I'm intrigued. Well, I think they're two halves of the same thing. Um, And at 21 or 22, when I graduated, I had no idea how to draw the distinction and just went on the assumption that there would be more variety. I think there's variety in both roles. Uh, And I think there are transferable skills between advertising and marketing. But career-wise, I decided to go for advertising and have stuck with it for for the years and decades yeah. since. And so wh- where did you end up then after the rejection letter? <laughs> where did you end up? <laughs> well, I um, did get a to... job. I did get a job. So I started in an agency called Alan Brady and Marsh. I okay. did two years there and nine at Ogilvy and then landed at, at AMV in 92. Right. I think one thing that's always slightly fascinated me, fascinated me as well, and lots of people have spoken to, they been working at their companies for quite long periods of time. I feel today people chop and change jobs perhaps more often than before. I'd just be interested if you think, is that a necessity of the time of people having to have you know, changing and evolving skills? Or do you think people are missing out on finding a career and a job that they love and staying with that company for a long time? Yeah, well, I've been here 25 years, which has whizzed by and feels like about five years. But I think I'm... There are plenty of people here. There's about 20 of us who've worked here for over 20 years. So I'm neither the rule nor the exception here. There Mm. are plenty of us. But I think the trend is that people are moving more frequently. The advice I always um, give to people is if you're happy and learning, stay where you are. Um, There's no point moving if you're happy and learning. And advertising, I think, is a career where you can learn new skills and work on different client business and build your skills especially now uh, when the whole market's exploding um, but I think if you're if you're happy and learning in the right place uh, you don't need to you don't need to move and that's been my exception my my experience hmm. do you think it's a society thing people moving or is it on companies to to give people more development opportunities and grow Well, I think you've got to um, look after people to the extent that they feel that there are fresh challenges ahead and an infrastructure of support around them to help them develop. And that's the onus on companies to make people feel like they don't need to leave. Um, I think it's, it's training them to stay and motivating them so they don't leave. And that's been my experience here. How do you feel about the pace of change of things? So we were speaking before, and so when I spoke to um, Phil Thomas, he was saying he felt that the industry had changed more in the last year than in the 10 years preceding. 
What, what do you see from an AMV perspective? Well, there are huge changes in the industry and all around us, and technology has brought a totally different way of working and ability to engage and measure and uh, capitalise on insights and responses really quickly. So the speed of change and the speed of delivery that we we have to administer in that change is, is incredible. And, you know, looking back over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years in the business, you can see remarkable change. But you sound like an antique when you go back 30 years and say, oh, we didn't have computers and we didn't have iPhones and, you know, all the things we Mm. take for granted now and technology. But I think we've got to be on top of that change and and innovating with it and maximising the opportunities that the change brings. And is that something that you find is increasingly difficult to do because of the rate of change? How do you go about it? No, it's very exciting because I think when I started in advertising, sounding like a dinosaur again, you know, there were four or five different roles and disciplines that you could go into. And there's probably 50 different roles and disciplines you can go into now. So jobs and job titles that we didn't have. Uh, 10 years ago so it's a very exciting place to be requiring lots of different talents and skills so here's an interesting question I'm not sure how I would would you rather start now or when you started well you don't have much choice in in the matter do (laughs) you Um, but I think it's always exciting to start in a new business and it feels new and that's the motivation and that's what keeps people in the business for a long time that there are fresh challenges every day so um no, I'm very happy starting when I started, but um, I think you've got to approach each day as, you know, like your first day in the business with the same eagerness to learn and exploit and um, develop the, the opportunities around you. What do you think, like with all that change as well, are there a few things that you'd pick out that actually, and maybe some that might surprise people that are consistently the same and actually underpin success in the long run well people people and human insights and remembering uh the human side of things both in terms of developing your talent and extracting the insights that can turn into powerful creative ideas so technologies have changed and people haven't and uh what makes people tick and what's important to people is um are the ingredients of of great work and great ideas. What keeps you up at night in terms of all that change, or just as a pure challenge to the business? Well, I think making sure that we are exploiting all the opportunities it brings and that we can simplify and focus within it because there's a whole wealth of opportunity and uh, opportunities to do lots of things, but keeping focus and making sure that technology simplifies things for people and makes life easier and making sure that the customer experience is two clicks, not 20. You know, those kinds of, are we making things easy and simple enough? And I think that really is a key role for marketing and advertising to make customers' lives better and simplify things for people because... With all this change comes a lot of complication. And I think the brands that really understand it best understand how to simplify and make that easy uh, in transactional terms and in communication terms. Do you feel uh, there's an element of that as well in not siloing different channels of marketing and trying to see it as an overall strategy? God, yes. Strategy I mean, I think like... ego and silo have no place right. in modern marketing and advertising and they stand out so so horribly now ego and silo um so i think you've got to collaborate i think you collaborate or die and again just like there used to be five or six jobs there used to be four or five agencies on a client's roster now you're in a roster of about 15 to 20 specialists with whom you need to develop great ideas so there is no space and time for ego and silo there is pride and there is respect for the craft Mm. there is energy and creativity and enthusiasm but 
ego and silo look very old-fashioned and there is no time and no energy for it anymore. And do you think it's that collaborative approach rather than seeing something like a threat, sort of embracing it and trying to make the most... Yeah, I mean, one of the things I've learned is that you can't force collaboration and people either are collaborative and want to be or they're not. Um, So you can encourage it, you can stimulate it, you can create the right environment in which it can flourish, but you can't tell people to collaborate if they don't want to. Um, But you can celebrate those who really do. And you can see it in the work uh, and the clients that really focus on that and and run rosters that make each agency and specialist do their thing without fear, without fear that someone's going to nick their revenue or nick their responsibility. Um, so I think, you know, there's no place for ego and silo in client organisations anymore or either because they're trying to develop a single customer view and they have to collaborate in order to deliver that service to their customers. And for you, as a very well-established and large agency, does that result at all in feeling like you're collaborating more with startups within the ecosystem? Yeah, with lots of different people. With lots of different people. I mean, we've always been good collaborators because we've always had a group and an infrastructure in the holding company in Omnicom of working well with one another and... um, Again, not being told to, but being encouraged to by the strength and quality of those disciplines. So we've we've always been good collaborators and the best people that operate in those companies are. How do you choose between not racing after a new fad, but also embracing something that might be a big opportunity? Because that must be a bit of a balancing act. Yeah, well, I think you fail on some of the new fads and get your fingers burned and move on and are in our experience you've got to um focus on the customer i think if you you can't go far wrong if you keep listening to the the customer and i think the art of communication is is listening really carefully to what's said and um what isn't said (laughs) and focusing on the customer is the way to make sure you don't get too carried away with um, with tricksy stuff that that isn't going to improve the lives of the consumer. But that willingness to learn and fail, is that different from before, do you think? Um, I think there's more opportunity because there's more kit to play with and experiment with. Um, but I think there's more willingness with clients to experiment, test, refine, look at the ROI and um, re-examine and then reinvest. So I think there's a willingness to, but you have to be able to deliver the the return on investment. So if you really give a piece of advice to somebody, would it be to open up that willingness to to test, but make sure you're measuring? Well, I think the advice is, you know, learn fast, fail, fail fast, move on, learn from the experience. But, you know, I think you've got to have a spirit of innovation and try new things. Um, we've we've invested heavily as a network in a curated crowdsourcing platform this year that's proving to be a really interesting model and delivering some really good work. Um, but we kind of Ubered ourselves in, in, in doing that. Um, and that is proving very popular with clients and very strong creatively. But it is a new way of working and something we're, we're um, testing and it's in beta, but it's, so far it's going well. Is that your Fuse? A Flare Studio. Flare. That's it, sorry, yeah. apologies. And so that's essentially, you say to a degree, democratizing creativity. Would that be a right phrase for it? Or how would you? Well, I think it? it's a, it's about innovation in creativity and finding better, faster, cheaper ways to get communication out to consumers, with consumers, for consumers, by consumers. So I think the, the old mantra of good, fast, cheap, take two, you can't have all three, has gone. I think you have to be able to be good, fast and cheap all at once that's interesting I end up saying that with what we do at Whaler and I always feel slightly cheeky saying it in a pitch but it does fit fast cheap 
and high quality. And as you say, before that wasn't possible, but by opening up the world and, you know, there's lots of people willing to work on creative Yeah, it's hard. As well. It's hard to make all three work at once, but talk to any chief procurement officer in town and that's what they want. Yeah. I guess it's it's all still comes down to that creative set of brand positioning, briefing, you know, directing it. It's just using more resources to fulfill. Well, of course, you've got to have good strategy and good data and good people and brilliant creative at the heart of it. But I think with that combination, which is why all the technology in the world won't deliver if you haven't got great talent at the forefront. So it's talent first, technology second, and then doing something great with both. But the talent first bit is the bit we, okay. we're most passionate about. So I saw you uh, wrote somewhere as well, or maybe spoke um, to this, and it's pretty commonly regarded thing of, you know, it used to be a few assets that you'd have to create, and now it's hundreds or thousands yeah, a yeah, year. Yeah. Are we getting too inundated with advertising as a result? Are we becoming slightly... Bombarded. Bom- yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the surveys that are done saying fee- people do feel bombarded by advertising. I know the, the Ad Association regularly track this, and, and the feedback comes back from the general public that they do feel bombarded and that there's too much advertising and not enough that really speaks to them creatively. So I think we have to make sure that our work operates to a central strategy to clear insights that are meaningful and memorable that our work moves people otherwise it is it is bombardment but I think you know the the point you're referring to is is probably a piece around you know we used to do one or two big pieces of content a year and that was enough and now there's hundreds and it's a always on the strategy and day in day out and it has to be very responsive and we have to get work out within we did some work for guinness on the rugby world cup and you know we were getting work out within an hour of the final whistle <laughs> whereas before you know the the work on guinness would take months of planning research um analysis improvement development and we're still doing that kind of hero work but equally, at an operational level, we we need to be able to be good, fast, Absolutely. and cheap but in the moment. On what would you say has been the time work? gap between from when you had ages to spend on those to that moment now of hours? Is is that like three to five years ago difference? Or um, I think that's yeah, probably, probably, um, and I think most brands now operate on that ability to be able to operate to the hub hero hygiene model that that you need to do all three well which is a a function of good fast cheap the big hero work still really important uh, but hub and hygiene need to work in tandem and importantly everything should look like it's from the same stable and that it's joined up um, because the other bit is it's not as if brands necessarily have more budget in the advertising to have all those assets which i think is why the good fast cheap is there yeah. as well because... and if if you think of some of the work we've done on confectionery and particularly for Mars on Snickers you know you're not you when you're hungry you can see lots of content all around the world that is geared to uh, immediacy as well as the big brand uh, thematic work and lots of really interesting innovative stuff that we've done on on Snickers over the years. How do you feel about this as a, a theme? It, it goes in with that that more content being put out and more channels. So a notion that you know previously you'd, you'd create those two hero assets and culture for a brand's recognition within society and culture would be delivered from those big hero assets. Yeah. Now, if we went to a room of a, a hundred people, even each hundred person probably consumes a unique feed of content mm, yeah. every day. Yeah, and kind of this notion that what was once top-down culture setting is a little more bottom-up today yeah. or somewhere in the middle. And to the point, if you're not getting in those micro moments exactly. of, of conversation of society, then actually top-down alone isn't, isn't going to work it, anymore. It isn't sufficient. I mean, I think the analogy that's often used is the difference between 
10 pin and pinball that actually it used to be 10 pin bowling where you would put all your assets into one thundering ball and whack it down the 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 slide as fast as you could and as hard as you could to to achieve <laughs> achieve the strike and and deliver the the impact and it was like that but now it's much more subtle in terms of pinball where you know flippers assist the idea the ball moves in different directions things come in from the side the ball's always in play and it needs constant supervision it's not one big push so um, I, I, I think it. it's, yeah, it's a really helpful one because it feels like it is. I mean, a launch is not a launch and then it's over. A launch is the beginning of of a campaign effort. But I, I think, I mean, we believe really strongly and passionately here in getting to a platform ideas that, that drive all those assets, uh, Hero Hub and Hygiene Assets. So on Guinness, we operate to Made of More as our platform idea all around the world. And all the assets are glued together by that that insight that it's a beer that's made of more for men that are made of more and drinkers that are made of more. And that that is the, the central idea. So I think without a platform idea, it can go all over the place. But with that strong insight-driven platform idea there's the capacity to do great work what's yet to do at amv what if you could click your fingers and and push through one change more quickly within the organization or within the industry for you what would what would it be well i think we're looking as every agencies are on sharpening insights sharpening insights through data um through cultural insight um, through traditional consumer insight. So I think with greater consumer insights, uh, we are feeding our creative people with the best possible um, material and an armory to develop great work. So I, I think, you know, the heartbeat of an agency is its creative product and that needs to be fed with great, great insight, consumer insight. So I would never go too far from the consumer. And what do you feel about the, or, or is it a challenge is the question. So I won't phrase it as what do you feel about the challenge. Is it a challenge with the new platforms of communication, the new things that are needed to be done to reach out to people if uh, you or the team working on it are distant from the users of that platform so you know if it's something like snapchat for example and it's not yet used by the brand teams here how do you get to embrace something like that and be able to know how to use it in a meaningful way yeah for your clients? really really important and i think it doesn't just go for the medium i think it's the product and the message as well that you know you can't be really effective at selling something if you don't understand the medium and the message so I think and i Keith think spoke to the risk of like a lost generation of marketers, for example, that don't have that touch point. Yes, it. or the reverse sometimes is true, where you know the the media that we consume as ad people is different from the media that mm. normal people consume. And you know, one of the big criticisms clients can level at us is, you know, we're in our own little echo chamber of. London Cool, or one client calls it Shoreditch Cool, even though we don't work in Shoreditch, <laughs> yeah. but we know what he means okay. by that. So I think it's not staying in an echo chamber is really important. And uh, how do you break that? Well, I think you have to break it consciously because you choose who you want to follow on on Twitter, you choose your friends on Facebook, and you know if you're not careful, you just operate in a a consistently affirming world that doesn't actually show you what's really going on so that's why you know you think you need to invest in the cultural insights and the media insights and i think the closer media and creative can work together the the tighter that that unity but i think we have we have to be practitioners we have to know what we're talking about and we have to get out of london as well um because i think there is a, a as as Various political events have shown recently, you know, the, the London perspective um, isn't always the national or the international perspective. Do you think that's becoming more important? Yeah. Yeah, with things. Yeah. Because of how interconnected everybody is. Yeah, back into groups in Manchester <laughs> yeah. and uh, places 
around the country as well. So if you had to predict the ways in which AMV might change in the next two or three years, what do you think that's going to look like? Well, we want to be um, the agency that is producing the best work that works best for our clients. So that's the central objective of delivering outstanding work that delivers results for our, our clients and having an unfair share of the best talent to to help us deliver that. So that's one of the things that hasn't changed and AMV is going to be 40 later this year and, and that was the same on day one. Um, so that won't change. Do How we do it will. Changing? To, to fulfill it yeah it's changing all the time as I said earlier you know there are lots of new roles that we didn't have years mm. ago um, and that's very exciting that we can bring people in in, in different roles and um, our client portfolio is really important to that follow up question would be what one piece of advice would you give to somebody starting out in the industry today well I would um, advise them to embrace the huge opportunities that the industry affords um, and to work hard and learn as fast as they can. One thing I wish I'd done that I didn't do before I started is get some decent financial training. Um, And I think starting off with some kind of financial understanding of the business model in advertising would be be something I wish I'd done. Hmm. Running it, running a business before entering a business, I think, would would be helpful. Perfect, to great. Know. No, well, Silla, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Pleasure, pleasure. And now I've got my quick fire quick fire. He reaches for his right. pocket. So, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. The best business book you've ever read? Uh, Good to great, Jim Collins. Uh, name someone who's inspired you the most. I have to say, my boss, otherwise he'll kill me, Andrew Robertson. Mm. Uh, your favorite band. Favourite band, Coldplay. Favourite movie? I loved An English Patient. If you didn't work in this industry, what else would you be doing? Oh, a chef. A chef, yeah. Do you cook lots now? I do, but I need lots of training and development. Uh, What's a tiny thing that annoys you the most? I'm a real grammar queen, so when people misspell it's and it's, I get disproportionately upset. judgmental Perfect. and Noted upset. Noted for any yeah. emails I send you. Exactly, detail. Uh, if you had a time machine, when and where would you go? I think I would trace back through my father's uh, early life. Uh, That's cool. He was one of 13 children. Oh, 13 yeah. children? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think I would go back and have a look at all the, the other 12. This will be a good one. If you were running for office, what would your campaign slogan be? Um, well, there's a great quote in Wonder Woman, uh, which I haven't seen, but but I love the question. It's it's we rise by lifting others. I think that would be my uh, like that. my slogan. And the last question, a random question, because it's whaler related: beluga, blue, humpback, or killer whale? Blue. There we go. Perfect. Thanks, Hilla. Thanks for listening. That's a wrap on season one of the Whaler podcast. Hope all of you enjoyed it. And a big thanks to each of the guests that that joined us. Uh, Watch out for season two. We will be back soon with another group of amazing speakers. Cheers.